You know, we are, we are part of the church that's been fulfilling the great commission of Jesus for 2,000 years on the side of a hill. Jesus took 11 ordinary people and said, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'll be with you always to the very end of the age. It's been the mission of the church for 2,000 years to go into all the world and to make disciples or to make followers uh, as a church. Uh, our mission statement is a reflection of that great co commission in slightly uh, more cultural language for us today. Uh, we are leading people to become fully devoted followers, or it's another way of saying disciples of Jesus. We're leading people to become fully devoted followers of Jesus. And we're all on that journey. Every single one of us, even Alice, who was sitting up the back this morning at 100 years of age, she's still learning to become a fully devoted follower of Jesus. One day we'll be made perfect. We'll be made completely whole when we see Jesus face to face. But while we're still on this earth, we're on a journey of discipleship. We're on a journey of becoming fully devoted followers of Jesus. I want to just talk a little bit about that today. I'm praying that today we'll all take a step. We'll, we'll all put something into practice in our lives that will actually help us to become fully devoted followers of Jesus. I'm just going to read from just two uh, really short parables. They're actually Jesus' shortest two parables. Uh, Jesus actually really repeats himself because he wants to make a point in these parables. He's just saying the same thing in, in a slightly uh, different way. You know, Jesus, as a preacher, repeated himself, and preachers have been doing it for the last 2,000 years. We all repeat ourselves uh, to make a point, and Jesus is making a really important point here. So Matthew chapter 13, it says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy, everyone say, in his joy, went and sold all he had and bought that field. That seems like a really, I'll just pause there before I read the second one, that seems like a really unusual situation to us. You've got to remember Back then, they were regularly invaded by armies who would, who would pillage and loot their treasures, and they had no banks. They had no safety deposit boxes. They, they, they had no personal safes uh, hidden in their home. They had no offshore account in the Caymans where they could hide their money from the tax money man or from the uh, invading armies. And so what they would do is they would take a shovel, they would dig a hole, and they would bury their treasure in their field. So if an army did come and did steal their crops and steal all their food, they would still have some treasure hidden that would enable them to survive at a later time. And only the family knew where the treasure was hidden. But obviously in this story... This, this family has either been wiped out, sadly, or someone has forgotten where the treasure's been hidden. And this lucky punter stumbles across some treasure hidden in a field. And all he has to do to make that treasure legally his is to buy the field. And so it says, in his joy... He went and sold everything he had to buy that field. It was a little bit like back in the olden days when we used to have cash in our pockets. We, we would hide cash under our mattresses. And uh, I remember my sister, when she got married, she inherited a bed from her husband's uncle, which she wasn't all that happy about, to be honest. She didn't want her first bed to be her uncle-in-law's. Until one day when she was cleaning the bed frame, she found rolls of 20s and 50s hidden in the bed frame. That brought her a little more joy. <laughs> this is what's happening here. In his joy, he finds something unexpected, and what he finds is so good, it's so valuable, that he's willing to sell everything else he has to get it. You see, every single one of us here in this room and online have got a joy meter. We, we, we've got a, an inbuilt joy meter in, in our hearts. We weigh up the cost that we're willing to pay for something for the joy that it promises. 
brings greater joy, but will pay a greater cost. But we've all got a joy meter. I just, you know, just see where our joy meter is sitting today. You know, at uh, Easter, I talked about, you know, the privilege of sitting in a $1,386 seat, you know, to watch a Taylor Swift concert. Who is willing to pay that kind of cost to shake it off with Tay-Tay? Come on, just show, show our hands or online. Come on, who's the Swifties in the room? There's just a, just a couple of nervous people, you know, putting... Their, their hands up, just kind of, you know, willing to pay the cost for the joy uh, that it promises. This one I know is true for a bunch of you because I, I know you've done it. Who's willing to pay three and a half thousand dollars for a cute little labradoodle? Come on, come on, yeah, there's a bunch of you. You know, for the joy of cleaning up mess around your house and paying extravagant vet and grooming bills for the next 12 years, you're willing to pay the cost. This one came up on my Facebook feed during the week. All expenses paid, Scandinavian cruise, $2,860 something about $2,800. <laughs> hey, yeah, 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 come on, it's been a big weekend. $28,000. All, all I need you to know is the algorithm got this one wrong. I've never been cruising doesn't appeal to me at all. I don't like the cold. I don't want to go to Scandinavia, and I'm paying for two weddings this year. I, I'm not going on a Scandinavian cruise. But who's willing to pay that cost for the joy that it promises? Come on, there's a bunch of cruisers in the room, just love cruising. We're willing to pay the cost for the joy that it promises. Next one, I know this is true for some of you because I've had a look around the car park this morning. Who's willing to pay $61,000 for a car that you have to plug in before you get to Gimpy. Come on, put your hands up. If you, there's, there's, a bun, there's a bunch of you. You're willing to pay the cost for the joy of plugging that car in that it, uh, that promises. And lastly, the most expensive thing that most of us will ever buy is a house. And we're, uh, we, we've got to weigh up if it's worth the cost. Many of us, our first home was what was called a renovator's delight. Who bought a renovator's delight? Uh, there's a first home. And when we had to weigh out the cost, whether it was worth it for the joy that it promised for the next 30 years. And you add up the interest and the conveyancing costs and the Bunnings bills, and it's a pretty big cost to do up a delightful dump. We've got to weigh up whether it's worth the cost of living with our parents for another three years or willing to mortgage ourselves for 30 years. We've all, we've all got it. I can keep going example to example. We've all got a joy meter. We're all deciding what cost we're willing to pay for the joy that it promises. In this parable, the joy that it promised this lucky guy the joy of that treasure that he saw, he was willing to pay everything, everything that he owned because he'd never seen, he'd never come across something so valuable. Next parable, it really says the same thing. It says this again, and Jesus is saying again, I'm just repeating myself, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Once again, pearl, pearl merchants spent his whole life looking for fine pearls at a time when pearls were normally more expensive than, than gold. But when he came across this particular pearl, he'd been looking for him his whole life. He saw a pearl that was so precious, it was so much better than any pearl he'd ever seen before. He sold everything he had to get that pearl. In both parables, the treasure is so valuable that it's worth paying whatever the cost to get it. Now, we need to understand parables, uh, stories of everyday people or everyday places that point us to an unseen spiritual reality. They help us to understand something about the kingdom of heaven which is unseen by, by looking at things on earth. 
And we're not supposed to dig into every fine little detail of parables. Essentially, Jesus' parables are making one big point that's a challenge for our lives today and in every season of our lives. And the one big point in both of these parables is that the joy, the joy of knowing Jesus is always greater than the cost of following Jesus. The joy of knowing Jesus is greater than the cost of following Jesus. King Jesus is the priceless treasure. King Jesus is the pearl of great price. It's worth giving everything to know Jesus and to enter his kingdom. Neither parable minimizes the cost of following Jesus. Neither parable minimizes the cost of the treasure or the cost of following Jesus. You see, when we confess Jesus as our king and we enter his kingdom, remember his kingdom is not a geographical place, his kingdom is wherever Jesus rules and reigns. And so when we put our faith in Jesus as king, we're saying, you rule and reign in my life from now on. We're handing over the the rule of our lives to King Jesus. There's a cost. There's a cost to follow Jesus, but the joy of knowing him is so much greater. Mary knew this was true. Mary Mary is the sister of Martha the complainer. I'm pretty confident we're gonna get to heaven and Martha is gonna say, I regretted ever complaining. You've been known as a complainer for the last 2,000 years. Mary is the sister of Martha the complainer and Lazarus the dead man walking. And we, we know from other places in scripture that Mary just loved getting to know Jesus. She loved sitting at the feet of Jesus. Unheard of in the culture of the time for a woman to sit at the feet of a rabbi and listen, but Mary would not be dissuaded. She just wanted to know Jesus. One time, Jesus comes around uh, for dinner to their place, John chapter 12, and Mary takes a very expensive bottle of perfume and pours it on Jesus' feet. Very expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed his feet. The word there that's translated expensive is the Greek word polutimus. And here it's translated expensive in John chapter 12, but it's actually the exact same word in Matthew chapter 13. That is translated, you know, a pearl of great value. It's incredibly valuable. It's very expensive. It's it's polutimus. She pours out this expensive, valuable ointment on Jesus' feet. It was so expensive that Judas says a couple of verses later. It says, this is worth 300 denarii. You know, what a, what a waste. This is half, this is a year's wages. Should have been given to the poor. A denarii was a laborer's daily wage. This is a year's wages. She's just poured out on Jesus' feet in a moment of worship. Probably, scholars would say, this was Mary's nest egg for the future. It was her priceless treasure. It was what gave her security for the future. She had a year's wages saved up. But the joy of knowing Jesus, the joy of worshiping Jesus, she just pours her future, her security out over Jesus' feet. Mary knew that the joy of knowing Jesus was greater than the cost of following Jesus. Paul also knew it was true. Now, Paul is like the pearl merchant. You know, he'd amassed some fine pearls, some fine achievements in his life. He has incredible pedigree of spirituality. This is what it says in Philippians 3. It says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I'm part of the people of Israel. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. In regard to the law, I'm a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Even if you didn't understand the importance of all the ones going before that, not many of us in this room or online can say, according to the law of the God, of God, I'm faultless. None of us would sit here and describe ourselves as faultless. But Paul had amassed some fine pearls. He had some great achievements. Paul 
had a pretty good spiritual pedigree. But when he comes across this pearl of great price, when he sees a pearl that's better than ever he's seen before, when Jesus knocks him off his horse, he's willing to give up everything for the joy of knowing Jesus. Just a little bit more. Listen to what it says a little bit further down, Philippians 3. It says, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him. These next five words I reckon are just really important for us. I hope this is the cry of our heart today. I wanna know Christ. I just wanna know Christ. I wanna know the power of his resurrection. I even wanna share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, whatever the cost. I just wanna know Jesus. The joy of knowing Jesus, Mary knew it. Paul knew it, the joy of knowing Jesus is always greater than the cost of following Jesus. Let me pause here, because some of you are getting a little concerned. You can't buy your way to heaven. You can't earn your salvation. There's nothing you can do to achieve forgiveness and righteousness in the sight of God. Salvation is a free gift given to you in Christ Jesus, there's nothing you've got to do to earn it. There's no way to pay for it. There's, there's nothing you've got to do to achieve it except receive it by faith through the grace that God has offered us. Amen. It's a gift. But if you want to grow in your relationship with Jesus, if you want to become more like Jesus, if you want to become a fully devoted follower of Jesus, there's a cost, and it shouldn't surprise us. There's a cost to every relationship. If you wanna grow in intimacy in a relationship, if you wanna grow in joy in a relationship, and we're gonna just look a little bit at the marriage relationship today. There's, there's my, my son and, and, his, and his new bride, they, they have got a, hopefully, decades ahead of them of selflessly sacrificing themselves for one another to know the joy of marriage. And there's no other way. If you don't make the sacrifice, you don't get the joy. The only way to know joy and intimacy in our human relationships is to make sacrifices for the one we love, to actually put our own needs aside, to lay down our lives and love them. Now, our relationship with Jesus is different to our relationships with one another, but that principle is still the same. If you're going to know the fullness of joy in a relationship with Jesus, there is a cost. I want to talk to you about what some of those costs are today. Firstly, there's a time cost. You know, for me, there was a sacrifice of time to get to know Susan. Uh, 30 something years ago, in the early days, it was a sacrifice that I, of time that I could have spent playing footy or surfing with my mates. But I had to sacrifice time to get to know someone who didn't want to play footy and didn't want to go surfing. These days, 30 years later, it's a sacrifice of time that I could spend watching footy on the TV or surfing the web, watching others catch great waves. But there's still a sacrifice of time, and some sacrifices are greater than others. But this is the point, and I want us to get it. If you don't make the sacrifice of time, you don't get the joy. This is the other thing. Over time, the sacrifice becomes the joy. What might start as a sacrifice is the thing that actually becomes the joy. I love my time with Susan. Because over the last 30 years, we've grown in intimacy. Our relationship has gotten stronger. And so spending time together is the joy. And it's the same in our relationship with Jesus. There will be a battle going on in your head every day. If there's not, God bless you. Because there is for me. Every day there's a battle going on. There's other more important things you can do with your time. There's other priorities, there's things you've got to get to. 
The enemy, more than just about anything else, you know, wants to rob you of the joy of knowing Jesus personally and intimately. And so he's always gonna put thoughts in your head that there's something more important that you need to do than spend time at the feet of Jesus, spend time in Jesus' words. There's always gonna be something more important to do and you're gonna have to make a sacrifice. It might be a sacrifice of of work. It might be a, a sacrifice of scrolling social media. It might be a sacrifice of binging Netflix or it might be a sacrifice of shopping for shoes. As I said, Some sacrifices are greater than others. You have to make the sacrifice to get the joy. And I just wonder if we're at this this stage of the year, we're kind of a term in, we're about to kick into term two, and it's time to reset our calendar. Maybe today, for some of you, there's a a cost of time that you need to make. The cost of following Jesus right now is, is a cost of time. I just want all of you to pick up one thing today. Just one thing, Jesus. Don't try, I've got four points, but don't try and pick up all four. Just one thing. For some of you, it's a reset of your calendar. It's a cost of time. And I promise you, what starts as a sacrifice will become the joy because the joy of knowing Jesus is always greater than the cost of following him. Secondly, there's a training cost. Most of you, you, you can't wake up tomorrow morning and try and run a marathon. You just won't be able to do it. Some of you will, but most of us here in this room or online, if you wake up tomorrow morning and just try and run a marathon, you won't be able to do it. But most of us, not all of us, but most of us, over time, if we got up tomorrow morning and started training for a marathon, and you kept training for a marathon, Over time, most of us here in this room could run a marathon. You you could do it. Right right now, I'm training to run a half marathon because I feel too old to run a full marathon. And every morning, there is a decision and a struggle to put my sneakers on and to get these old legs moving again. Now, I know some of you won't believe this, But when you get, or for me, when I get to about that seven kilometer mark, I feel the joy of running. What starts as a sacrifice has become the joy. In fact, right now, for the last six weeks, my Achilles has messed up and I haven't been able to run. And for six weeks, I've been missing the joy of running. I know it's hard for you to believe, but it's true. You can't try and run a marathon, but you can train to run a marathon. Similarly, you can't wake up tomorrow morning, watch a half a dozen YouTube clips of some karate moves and become a black belt by the end of the day. You've got to wax on and wax off. And then you've got to wax on and wax off again. And if you've got no idea what I'm talking about, talk to someone who grew up in the 80s. Wax on and wax off. And you've got to do it over and over again. And at some point, you'll become an expert. And I'm not sure how much joy there is in successfully snap kicking someone in the solar plexus. But sometimes it feels like it could be joyful. But there's obviously a lot of joy in just tying that black belt around your waist. No one messes with you. This is the point. You can't wake up tomorrow and try and become like Jesus. Doesn't matter how hard you try. Some of you tried being convicted on Sunday and on Monday. So I'm just going to be more. I'm going to be more loving. I'm going to be less lustful. I'm going to be more kind and forgiving. I'm going to use my words better. I'm just going to try and be more like Jesus. Won't work. I know a lot of people have walked away from their faith because they've tried that and it hasn't worked. But you can train to be more like Jesus. You won't become more like Jesus by watching a bunch of YouTube sermons, as good as it is to watch YouTube sermons. You're going to have to train over and over again to become more like Jesus. I just want to put a whole bunch of training moves on the uh, screen. I'm not saying try and do all of them, but maybe just pick up one of them uh, today. They all start with S because the first three started with S, so I thought I'd just keep going. There's hundreds of other training moves. These are just the ones that start with S. All right, firstly, soap. 
I've done this for years, I love it, I just read the Bible until I get to a scripture where I feel like God's speaking to me, that's S is for scripture, write it out. O is observe, what, what's God doing here? What's he saying? Write it out. A is application, what's he calling me to do? How am I gonna apply this? P is prayer, God help me, help me to become more like Jesus. What's the next one? Silent prayer, for some of us, you know, our, uh, and solitude. You know, for some of us extroverts, our, uh, not, I'm not an extrovert, so silent prayer and solitude is easy for me. I'd, I'd happily live as a hermit. But uh, for you, all you extroverts uh, in, in, in the room, some of your prayer, you know, it's just like verbal diarrhea. And, and you need to understand God loves it. He loves hearing your voice. But sometimes you're just saying, hey, just, hey, hey, just slow down. Let me talk to you. And it's actually as we're silent before him, he begins to shape our heart like him. Solitude, same deal, just getting away from everything to say, God, I'm here. Do with me what you will. Sabbath, just putting one day in seven aside. Don't get hung up on whether it's Saturday or Sunday or what day it is. Colossians says, tells, tells us not to worry about that. But just putting one day aside in, in seven where we actually focus on worshiping God. We focus on our relationship with God. We focus on our relationship uh, with our loved ones. And we put a whole bunch of other priorities aside. Really important principle. It'll, it'll shape your heart. Uh, simplicity, just getting rid of some clutter in your life. Some of your life is too cluttered. You've got to get rid of some stuff. Just live a little more simply uh, with Jesus. Study. Some of you got a big question about faith and right now it's just a, a time to dig into Bible study and just understand it not just for the sake of knowledge but as you understand it uh, Jesus will will shape uh, your heart for some of you it's serving I was uh, so good to honor Alice this morning at eight o'clock still serving at a hundred years of age if you've got an excuse why you can't serve in the church go and talk to Alice all right she's a hundred she's still going and uh, just find your place to serve it's actually, actually do what Jesus did and you wash other people's feet. You serve other people's needs that he'll shape you more like him. And submission. If you're looking at your life and you're going, you know, I'm not really submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ or I'm not really submitting to my spouse. It's just an active way or is an active training move of just choosing to submit, to put other people's needs before your own. They're all training practices. And maybe there's just one up there you go, okay, that's the cost of training. Let me just add one that doesn't start with S, just didn't fit the program at all. But uh, for some of you, it's fellowship. You actually need to get into a life group. Ah, oh, I could have said small group. Add that for five o'clock, small group. <laughs> get into a life group. We, we call our small groups life groups here at Gateway. It's the place where we open the word together, pray for one another. Get in community, we get shaped into the, the likeness of Jesus. The good news of training with Jesus is that unlike going to the gym to train, Jesus does all the heavy lifting. You just gotta give him the space. He, he changes you, his word will renew your mind, his spirit will transform you from the inside out. He does all the heavy lifting, you gotta give him the space, you gotta do the training. Thirdly, there's a treasure cost. Most, most of you blokes who have, started dating, got a girlfriend, got engaged, got married, knows that girls cost a heck of a lot of money and it just gets worse as you go on in the relationship. I, uh, when Susan broke up with me early on, we'd been on four dates, I said, hey, you owe me $137.56. <laughs> no, I didn't do that, so I'm not that bad. I had a friend who did. I'm pretty sure he's still single. So... Uh, <laughs> Don't add it up, but there's a cost. Don't get all upset. There's a cost. As relationships get more serious, the costs do go up. You gotta buy a ring, you gotta buy a house, you gotta buy one of those renovators' delights. There's a sacrifice. There's a sacrifice of treasure to invest into what's really important to the other person. Fully devoted followers of Jesus sacrifice treasure for what's important to Jesus. Jesus says it real simple. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Fully devoted followers of Jesus. It's not just a heart. It is a heart relationship, but it's a heart relationship that actually becomes a very practical outworking. And I tell you, this has been big for me. Giving doesn't come naturally to me. Susan's taught me a lot about giving. She's far more generous than me. Giving has not always been a joy for me. 
but it has become a joy as I've made the sacrifice. Last Sunday night was one of those moments for me. I was kind of like, hey, take my money. <laughs> take my credit card. Watching 300 young people sold out for Jesus, asking to be set apart to serve Jesus, crowding around that baptism as eight of their friends got baptized and they dedicated their lives to Jesus, seeing this whole auditorium chock-a-block full of young people and their families, just seeing faith get passed from generation to generation. I enjoy giving to that. I hope you do too. See, what starts as a sacrifice becomes a joy. Second Corinthians, the church in Macedonia worked it out. It says, in the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy in their extreme poverty, they came together and they welled up in rich generosity. For I testify they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us, get this, for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. Even in poverty, even in sacrifice, there can be an overflowing joy in giving generously to the things of God. I want to encourage you, maybe... Maybe today, that's the challenge. It, there's a whole bunch of ways you're devoted to Jesus, but not your bank account. And maybe today, God wants your heart. He wants your heart more than your treasure. Where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. There's a sacrifice, there's a cost of treasure. Lastly, they all had to start with T, so I was a little bit you know, challenged to get this one to work, but there's an entitlement cost. Entitlement with a capital T. You know, for a marriage relationship to grow, there's a sacrifice of entitlement when Susan and I get into a spirited discussion because pastors don't fight or argue. They have spirited discussions. That's not true either. We fight and argue like everybody else. I, I feel entitled. I, I feel entitled to hurt back if I've been hurt. I feel entitled to insult if I've been insulted. Unfortunately, the scripture says to husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church and lay down your lives for them. So if I'm going to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus, at some point I've got to give up my entitlement and I don't like it. And whether it's a marriage relationship, a work relationship, a family relationship, a friendship, a friendship that's broken apart in the church, whatever it is, you might feel entitled to gossip to insult, to hurt back, to stay bitter, to seek revenge, to pay back. But if you want to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus, there's a cost of entitlement. You've got to give it up. We live in an entitled generation. Our, our culture tells us that we can do whatever we want to be happy. Go for it if you like, but have a look around and just ask, how's this working for you? It's not. Jesus actually says the exact opposite. He says this, whoever wants to be my disciple or my fully devoted follower of Jesus must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. You see, we've got a saviour who denied himself the right to escape the pain of the cross. He denied himself the right to insult those who insulted him. He denied himself the right to hurt those who had hurt him. In fact, on the cross, he says those incredible words. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Followers of Jesus love like Jesus loves. They deny themselves, they deny what they feel entitled to for the sake of loving others like Jesus. There's a cost to discipleship, but the joy of knowing Jesus is greater than the cost of following Jesus. We've we, we got a saviour who knows what it's like to pay the cost. He understands the joy meter 
But we, we've got a saviour that knows what it's like to weigh up the cost for the joy that is promised. Hebrews chapter 12 says this, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What was the joy set before him? It was the joy of being seated at the right hand of God in the, ma the majesty of heaven and reconciling all of humankind to himself. Jesus knew the cost. It was going to cost the cross. It was going to cost his life. It was going to cost death in our place. He knew what it was going to cost to save us from the sin that separated us from God. But this is unbelievable. I still can't get my head, it's not unbelievable, it's true. It's hard to get your head around. The joy of saving you was greater than the cost of dying for you. The joy. The joy of saving you was greater than the cost of dying for you. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. You know why? This is incredible too. It's because you're his treasure. First Peter chapter two, verse nine says you're a, a chosen people, you're a holy nation, you're a royal priesthood. Come on, say it with me. You are God's special possession. Called to declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. You're God's special possession. What a joy and a privilege. He wants a two-way relationship of intimacy and joy, but it will cost you. The joy of knowing Jesus is always greater than the cost of following him. The treasure hunter, he was willing to pay whatever cost for the joy that he promised. The pearl merchant is willing to pay whatever the cost for the joy that it promised Mary, willing to pay whatever the cost for the joy of sitting at Jesus' feet and just getting to know him some more. Paul was willing to count everything rubbish, to put everything he's amassed in his life aside, all of his achievements, you know, all of the good things he's done, all, that his, all of his, his status in society. He was willing to put it all aside because he wants to know Christ. He wants to know the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, his Lord. Are you willing to pay the cost? The joy of knowing Jesus will always be the greater than the cost of following him. If your joy meter is not where you want it to be today, maybe there's just a new cost you need to pay. And we don't have to be embarrassed about it, we don't have to be ashamed about it. Because we're all becoming fully devoted followers of Jesus. None of us are there yet. So in different seasons, God's going to challenge us about the next step or the next cost that we need to pay, the next way we need to deny ourselves and to follow Him. I'd just love to pray for us as a church today. I'd love to pray for us just where you're standing or if you're online, just, uh, just type in the chat, you know, just one of those T's in just a minute. I'm just going to ask you just to respond to maybe a cost of time, a cost of training, a cost of treasure, or a cost of entitlement, something that God's just spoken to you about. And you're saying, I'm willing to pay that cost because I want to know the joy. I'm just going to ask you to stand just, just wherever you are and I'm going to pray uh, for you. I'm just going to pray a blessing over the church. But if that's, if that's uh, you this morning, and I'm just going to do it one at a time. You're saying, I'm willing to pay the cost of time. For that, that's been the challenge for you. It's a reset of the calendar. I want to pay the cost of time. I, I want to pay the cost of time to get to know Jesus more. Just stand where you are, if that's you. Come on, just don't, don't be ashamed. Just don't be embarrassed. Just stand up, if that's you. That's your challenge today. It's cool. For some of you, just type time in the chat, if that's you. Uh, training. You just, just, there's just a new training move. This is not something new. It's just, just God just spoke to you, just said, that's me. I'm putting a new training move in place. If that's you, just stand where you are. You're going to pay the cost of doing, doing that training. Awesome. For, for some of you, it's treasure. I oh, know it's hard to respond to that, but you just know you're not really finding joy in giving and you're not really making the sacrifice that, you know, Jesus called you to. And you, you want to 
do that. Simple. Just get your stand where you are. You're going to pay the cost of treasure. And lastly, and just type it in the chat if this is you. It's the cost of entitlement. It's hard. When you're hurt, when you've got pain on the inside and you want to insult back, you want to hurt back, you want to gossip. I think this is the, probably the bigger one for many of us. We're not going to go and punch someone. We're not going to snack, kick anyone in the solar plexus, but we'd really like to gossip. Someone's hurt us. Are you willing to pay the cost of entitlement? If that's you, whatever it is, come on, just stand. Stand where you are. I want to pray for us today. If anyone else just needs to respond, jump up now because I'm going to pray. I'm just going to open you to o- ask you to open your arms, open your heart, just let the Spirit of God do His thing. He will do all the heavy lifting, I promise. Father God, thank you. Thank you that for the joy set before you, you endured the cross. We're so thankful. We'll be thankful for all of eternity, Jesus. But for the joy set before you, you endured the cross. You scorned its shame. You sat down at the right hand of God. Thank you that you're seated now. Our salvation is secure. No one can steal it from us. But God, we want to get to know you more. We want to to know the joy of knowing you more and more every day. God, would you help us today to pay the cost of time? For those who have been challenged about that today, God, I pray for a reset of calendar. I pray they'd win that battle in their mind every day. When the battle happens, they would go and find that chair. They'd find that milk crate. They'd, they'd, they'd find that spot just to sit at your feet and to open your word. For those just putting into practice a new training move, God, even if it feels clumsy for a little while, we are kind of not sure what you're doing, God, I pray for a perseverance to keep training day after day after day. And there'd be a testimony in days to come, in weeks to come, in months to come, there'd be a testimony of transformation. God, I pray for those who've just been challenged about their giving today. God, I I pray today that there, there would be an overflowing joy and a rich generosity in the midst of sacrifice. God, there'd be a new joy in giving, just seeing you do amazing things on the earth as we, as we all give together. And lastly, for those that are feeling pain today, those that have been hurt, whether you're online or you're in the room, God, only by the power of your Spirit can we do this. Can we lay down our lives for the sake of others? Can we give up our rights? Can we deny ourselves to follow you daily? God, help us today to forgive. Help us to let go of bitterness Help us to stop gossiping. Help us to love and bless our enemies, those who have hurt us. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Come on, let's all stand together today. Come on, let's all jump to our feet. We're, we're going to sing this simple chorus. It says, I've decided to follow Jesus. Make this personal today. What does this mean for you in this season? What does it mean to follow Jesus in this season for you? What was the cost you're paying? What are you turning your back on to follow Jesus? Come on, let's lift him up. Let's sing it together. Let's declare it together as a church. I've decided to follow Jesus.
down the front uh, this morning. I just reckon there's a few people who just need to let God minister to you today. Uh, I just think there's some of you here, he's talked before uh, about just choosing to trust God in this season. I think there's some of you, people have broken their trust with you, whether it's in a, in a marriage or a divorce or in a workplace or a family relationship, there's broken trust there. And you, you actually know that it's making it difficult for you to trust God. Uh, just whoever's praying for you down the front today, I just, I just believe it's got to speak over you. Jesus will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus has not left you and he'll never forsake you. If you're online today, Jesus has not left you, he'll never forsake you. And I just believe he wants to build trust and confidence in your heart. You can trust him, lean not on your own understanding, but follow him in all of your ways. If that's you, just start to come. If, uh, if this morning, there's just a, you, just God, you just need God to restore joy in your heart, the joy of your salvation, just come. If you want prayer for anything, just come. We're here, we wanna pray for you. Whatever you're going through as you follow Jesus right now, just let someone pray for you. Just, gonna ring, just sing that chorus just, just two more times or decide to follow Jesus. Come on, just lift our voices. Lift our, lift our arms in surrender to Him. Just lift your hands in surrender or decide to follow Jesus or come down the front and let someone pray for you. Come on, let's do that together. your goodness and kindness to people outside of those doors. Help us to be fully devoted followers of Jesus wherever you take us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please come. Let someone pray for you this morning. Have a uh, great week. Enjoy those training moves as you put them into practice. And uh, members forum happening in just a few minutes' time. Out in the function room, just down to the right. God bless.